three is is pretty well cleaned up. Beauty. Hey, uh, Jack. Yes, sir. Okay, so the image we're looking at right now, that's a canned image, and then we're going to see Greg's current image shortly. Well, no, he's, uh, well, this is one that was recently pulled off the uh, off the scope. This is a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We have to, we have to say that, you know, live would mean that, you know, we'd actually see the scope moving, things like that, and that doesn't happen. What happens is we point the scope, he opens the imager, uh, right. allows it to gather light for an, a particular period of time, and then it sends that data to the computer, and we see it. Okay, so but we haven't, we haven't seen that yet. Yes, this is what he's on right now. That's it. Okay, wow. We're just, we're just waiting for, this is M3, and we're just waiting for, uh, which I think we're there, sounds like we're there, uh, darkness to get rid of all the little artifacts around the edges so that we're in good shape. So yeah, okay. this is this is what we got. Okay. So when you say you're waiting for darkness, uh, you mean outside darkness or yeah. computerized darkness? Yeah, outside. Well, right outside. now I think we're just waiting for nine o'clock when we told people this meeting would start. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That too. That too. <laughs> so Jack, I we are. Now broadcasting live on Facebook also. So maybe if you'd like to repeat a little bit about what's going on here, just for anybody who's joining from Facebook. Absolutely. Welcome to everyone. We have our second star party. We had a first trial of this earlier in the week and uh, it worked well. And we managed to find a hole in the clouds it crept up on us. So we have our normally scheduled um, star parties for the Friday closest to the new moon. I believe if I remember correctly, the new moon was Tuesday or Wednesday. So this is our closest Friday. Uh, since we can't get together at our usual place of uh, meeting at the Lake Taconic State Park, we decided to try Zoom in this environment with uh, at least one of our members who has a networkable telescope and that would be Greg Salyer, who is uh, presenting his screen right now. We're still getting set up, but we're just about there. We are looking at images created pretty much real time through Greg's telescope and his imaging system. Uh, what we'll do is he will select uh, a target from his software, the scope, which has a nice little animation down in the lower right corner there, will slew to that object. He will then image it and immediately after imaged, uh, imaging it, he will present that, uh, what the telescope sees. It's a little bit of a um, hold your breath moment because uh, we do still have a few clouds in the area, although they have cleaned up fairly nicely. So uh, there's a good chance, well, eh, less than a good chance, let's say a moderate chance that we might get a picture of a cloud, but uh, we will see that and that's what's really there. In any event, we're going to go through several, probably several Messier objects tonight. Um, Greg, uh, Greg earlier mentioned, we're currently looking at M3, which was Charles Messier's uh, first one that he actually discovered. And there's about 500,000 stars in that image. Um, we'll probably also target M51, M64, M81, M82, M94, M101, M106, uh, the Leo triplet, which is a beautiful 
uh, set of galaxies you know, that you can get in one field. And if we're lucky and the cloud doesn't cover it up, we might even get another view tonight of uh, Comet Atlas, the one that's breaking up. Earlier this week, we got an absolutely beautiful view of that thing, and I'm really hoping we see it again tonight. What? What, what? Comet Atlas? Was that a question? No, I'm wondering if my stuff is working. Ah, sounds like it. <laughs> Oh, um, Jack, we have yes, a question sir. also from chat from Steve Dittmer, wondering if the Crab Nebula is within our view for this telescope. Crab. Let me find the crab and see what it looks like. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can go check and see. Uh, it looks a bit low. It's in the west and it's about, uh, let me turn on things here. many lines it looks to me to be about 30 degree the under 30 degrees maybe 28 degrees above the horizon and directly west i think isn't that below your tree line it's uh very slightly up and to the left of venus Oh, the little red bit. Yeah. yeah, the little red thing. It's past. It's it's in the west. It's, it's in trees. Uh, we would have had to look at that like a month ago. So we we cannot see M one, which is unfortunate because that's a nice object. Some other month. <laughs> yep. We we passed it. We had to look at it a month ago. There's a lot of nebulas that we can look at though. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Oh, we're nine o'clock, so we can start. One thing I'd like all to right. make curiosity sake, it has no value at all. This thing collects so much light uh, in relationship to the human eye. But there are times when there are clouds out there. Your and radio is stopped. I'm looking at objects. I do this. My son will come in once in a while and say, Why are you looking at the star? There's only clouds up there. And yet the telescope can actually go through at least thin clouds and see stuff. Not, not well, but you can get through it. All right. I think we've covered this object pretty well. Why don't we move on to some other object? How many people we got here today? 46? Well, plus whatever More than that. Facebook. Let's go 40, to- 47 minus three. Let's go to uh, M51, which is one of my favorites. This is the Whirlpool Nebulae. And uh, we'll go to, should see the scope. Now, nope. while he's slewing, I want to, one of the things I always like to tell people, and maybe I'd say probably half the people here have heard me say this about three times so far, um, but I enjoy Messier objects a lot because of what they are. It was a list that Charles Messier put together of things that were not comets. And he kept finding these things that looked like they uh, thought uh, might have been a comet. And then uh, when he studied it for a while, of course, his optics weren't good enough to resolve it like we're seeing here. Uh, best he could do was say, no, that's not a comet. Don't bother to look at it anymore. It's boring. I personally don't think that's very boring. That's a nice enough object. I'm going to do a 30 second. That's a 10 second exposure. I'm going to try a 30 second. See if it comes in a little bit better. And once again, especially for the people who uh, can't watch take... it on the big screen because they got. What was that? Was that a question or was that just ambient noise? Yeah, I think if anybody's uh, not going to be talking, you should go on mute, please. Yeah, I was going to do that. Um, yeah, I was yeah. going to mention that uh, try to keep yourself muted, especially if you've got ambient noise. No problem if you've got a question. But uh, there's with uh, 40 plus people here, it's kind of hard to keep track of it. things when everything is moving around in the background. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll mention also that with Zoom, there's a neat feature that if you're muted, you can push the space bar on your computer and it's pushed to talk and then when you take your take your fingers off the space bar you go back to being muted 
<laughs> that sometimes even works, but don't have chat open. If chat is open, it'll just put space bar, uh, spaces in the chat. I would encourage anybody who's got a question to uh, ask it. Uh, this dialogue that we have back and forth sometimes is more useful than the pictures themselves. Absolutely. And you can also type a question in the chat and I'll make sure Jack gets it. Greg gets it. Well, I think Jack is monitoring. Are you monitoring the chat? I have it up and I'm also scanning down through the list to see who might have a uh, unmuted microphone. Oh. Speaking of um, dogs I'm and things playing and looking at that stuff. I'm going to try and stay on the uh, telescope screen. Yes, so that yes, no, that's where you stay. We'll bring anything yeah. to you. Um, now, this object, uh, well, when you take a multi-hour exposure of it, it becomes really pretty. I mean, actually, I, I think this is pretty good. But when you take a multi-hour exposure, I sometimes use that as my screensaver on the PC uh, because I like it so much. There's actually two galaxies here that are interacting a bit. And there's actually a third. A third? Way a third. down in the lower right hand corner, right? Oh, yeah, right, right here. A little tiny thing down there. It may not show up on some people's screens, but yeah, I can see it here. I should note that most of these pictures, there are galaxies in almost every image you take. It's just that they're so dim and far away, very small. Uh -huh. um, I ran a program once to tell me how many galaxies were in one of these pictures, and it was in the thousands. All right, let's try any favorites. How about M64? Black M64 eye. Next. Now that one is not as pretty uh, as this one, I don't think, but okay, but we'll see. M, what did I say? M64. M64. Okay. So while we're slewing, we have a question from Daniel asking, what scope are you using and what's the exposure for this image? I'm using a plane wave 12 and a half inch scope. Uh, this particular image that you're looking at right now is 30 second exposure. If I were making pretty pictures, I would say I would want at least 10 hours of exposures. But I don't think many people want to sit here for 10 hours waiting for <laughs> one exposure. We can show you, we can show a few of your really long ones later on if anybody's interested, which I know they will be. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have skewed, I haven't taken the picture yet, but we've skewed to the black eye galaxy. And I'm about to take a 10 second exposure. And where is that? It's in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to show your? Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, um, if you want me to shift off, I can. I can flip over and show Stellarium, and we'll show where it is. But uh, I was hoping we'd do that maybe afterwards. Yeah. I don't need that. I like that one. Okay, better. I've got them written down, and uh, we'll show you where in the sky we're looking. You would just a second. I, uh, one of the problems with uh, astroimaging is that unlike a normal camera, um, there's a very small range in exposures that you, that you end up with. In fact, if you look at this chart, if you can see my cursor up here, this little chart is showing um, the number of pixels that have a particular uh, strength. All the way at the left hand side is a strength of zero, and at the right hand side is a strength of 65,000. Notice all of the white is in a very narrow range. If you were to look at this photo in Photoshop, you wouldn't see anything. All you'd see is black because of all of this black here. Uh, astronomy programs know that, however, and try and guess at, at uh, how to show the uh, the picture best. And this little box here allows me to manually control the exposure. So I've got several different, different ways to look at things. Just, and we can try and figure out which one looks the best. Damn. Let me go to a 
medium. See, it looks different under different exposure conditions. Ooh, don't like that one at all. I think I like the low exposure better. Okay. All right, if you want to show your stel stellarium uh, view of where it is in the sky, go ahead. All righty. I may need for you to drop yours. Well, no, I can kick yours right off, I think. I think so, because I can't seem to get to the screen. All righty. Now let me turn my grid lines off here. All righty. And we have an imagery here. You can't really see it right now. I'm going to turn the lights uh, off here for a second. Uh, where is it? Oh, I guess I can't do that. No, never mind. But uh, this is actually a picture of the walkway over the Hudson uh, that Eric made for us. So um, you can tell uh, in the dark. Just one of our, yeah, one of our neat little things there. I could lighten it up, but I won't bother with that right now. Let's go to, um, we're looking for M64. All right, so let's back off here and whoops, that's a little too far. Now, what I see right off the bat here is the Big Dipper, it's right here. We were using that an awful lot the other night. And then of course, that means that Polaris is right down here. I can turn on some guides. We'll take a quick look at what we've got up there. But uh, we were, we we're noticing that there's an awful lot of galaxy action right around in this area. We've got Arcturus, Nice, very bright star in the sky. So we are looking almost due east. And if we were uh, using that to line us up, we would look east. We'd find a nice bright star of Arcturus and essentially see if we can't make a line off of the, um, uh, the arc for the handle in the Big Dipper here, kind of curve around that way and pretty close to an intersection right there. Uh, that's stretching it. <clears throat> stretching it which way? <clears throat> As a way to find that. But if we zoom in to Stellarium here, we will look. see that we've got the same thing in a stored image that Greg is looking at. And this is what happens when you spend 10, 20 hours getting an image, you get this color in it. But that's where we're headed right now. And we can pretty much bet that a lot of our imagery is going to be pretty close to the same area. Mostly because Greg's scope is only able to see right up and through here. Give it back to you there, Greg. Okay. Ah! We're not there. Greg, while you're waiting, um, I noticed that the cursor on your screen is hard to see on this. I don't know if there's a way to make it a bigger thing so people can see what you're pointing at when you're- There probably is, it. but I'm not gonna try and change it. I was gonna say, best not to worry about that right now. <laughs> I mean, we're all new to this Zoom thing, especially me. And uh, I'd rather not hit the wrong button and lose everything, but uh, we're not at back of my screen yet. Did you- uh... You need to share again. You need to share. Well, tell me how because remember the share button. I have no share button. Um, uh, we'll move your cursor around on the. We have to go back to this screen, share screen, and hopefully I'm going to hit the right one. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Let's find out. Yay! Perfect. 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 There it is. There it is. Okay. All right, now notice the, the nice thing about this particular galaxy is this black area right here. I guess that's why they call that the black eye. All right. Let's is there on. any way to zoom in on that part of the image? Oh, sure I can. Now, remember we're sacrificing resolution for time. So it may look a little blocky if we go too far. You can see the blocky notion here. It's like Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> I could go to more resolution, but I don't think you want to take all night while it gets enough time exposure on it. 
All right, let's move on to uh, M81. Oops, M81 right here. We should start slewing a little bit. I know M81 is <clears throat> the same general area. Got them dry. Yeah, moving more than I thought. Oh, that's right. I know why. Yeah. Scope is moving quite a bit. And M81 is about 12 million light years away. It's a galaxy of 90,000 light years diameter. If Wikipedia is to be trusted. Let me try changing the contrast. Kind of a boring galaxy, at least. Uh. Oh, I know. Let me. Let me go to 30 seconds. I know that's a long time for this meeting, but maybe we'll... Yeah, we get a little hint of the spirals coming out there, just a hair. And one other thing we'll point out is that, you know, once again, although this looks all nice and heavily technical and all that, uh, these things are visible in relatively modest telescopes. So uh, when we get out of this craziness that we're in currently, and, and if everybody's able to come see us in person out at the Lake Taconic uh, State Park, it's entirely possible that you can uh, get an actual naked eye view of this right through our telescopes. That's it's a little nicer. See, start to see the arms here a little bit. It's almost even a little color in that, just a touch. Well, it can't be color because I'm taking black and white photos. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's just my anticipation of it. I've got uh, I've got the deep, you know, the heavy duty image of it up on my other computer, and it's just imaginary. And I'm seeing a little brown there. Then. <laughs> it's, it's got a, oh, there's a companion um, object, and I'm going to guess it's down this way. I'm not really sure, but let's try it. I'm going to move the scope so this area right here is centered on the image. I'm not sure if I move it in the right direction or not, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be cool. Um, by the way, while uh, he's capturing the next image, uh, I'm mentioning occasionally that uh, I'm messing with uh, Stellarium, and we'll see that after we get a lot of these up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I imagine quite a few do, and maybe everyone does. Stellarium is a lovely free astronomical program that you can run on pretty much everything. Oh, look at that. So uh, I exactly get it centered, but it's OK. I think M82 it looks a little bit better than uh, M81 or at these exposure levels anyway. Now, what is that? That is I'm not sure because this thing isn't telling me. What's that? That's cigar galaxy is all it says. What yeah. uh M82 is a cigar, it's a it's an active galaxy. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really see here, but if you're looking at red with a long exposure, you would see some red outside of it. And it's called a starburst galaxy. Okay. I'm going to try M101, or should I try the Leo Triplet? Mm. I'm going to try the Leo triplet because I like the Leo triplet and it may be moving out of our range uh, pretty soon. Okay. Let me, I'm going to go to the sky. Jack. Yes. Do you know what uh, constellation 81 and 82 were in? I can tell you that in just one second. <clears throat> I 
I think it's the Ursa Major. Yeah, I was going to say Ursa Major is the closest one. That uh, would be, let's see, we have to get extensive with that. It's just, I would say it's just off of Ursa Major, right off the back of the bear. If you were to draw a diagonal line around across the deep part of the uh, the dipper part and extend it about the same distance away, you'd be uh, just about there. Starting another exposure. And this is the triplet now? Hopefully it's the triplet. Okay. Unless there's a galaxy up here, one here, and one here. Robert, do you have a question? Try different exposures here, or different contrast, I should say, see which one turns out the best. Oh, hey, good. This galaxy up here is one that I experimented with one time. Uh, a digital camera is really a uh, photon counter. And I found that this little region right here is emitting six photons a second for every pixel in this image. A useless number, but I thought it was interesting. Okay. Shall we try M101 now, the pinwheel galaxy? Absolutely. M101. So you have to say expose. <laughs> Gotta hit the button. Yeah, not totally automated, I guess. Now you may notice, I don't know on your screen, but this area on my screen looks a little bit lighter than on the left-hand side. And that's a property of our light pollution we have here in Wappingers. Actually, I'm in the town of Poughkeepsie, but I guess we all have that problem. Oh, yeah. Hey, we're astounded we can see anything tonight, the way the weather was looking. And there we have the pinwheel galaxy. Beauty. Very nice. Uh, OK. What to do next? How many seconds was the last one? Uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. You had 94, you mentioned earlier. 94, sure. Let's go find 94. I could look at that pinwheel for a while, though, let me tell you. Yeah, that's a nice one. Most of these are very nice when you can take hour-long exposures, but 
when we're just taking you know a few seconds like we are tonight um they're yeah, not this is great this is uh a degree or two better than when we're out with actual telescopes because these things are in fact so massively dim uh even with some of our larger the 13s uh telescopes you can uh, essentially just barely tell that you're looking at something and these uh, this imagery brings out uh, some detail that is extraordinarily difficult to actually see unless you have very very dark skies when you're doing visual astronomy with a, with an eyepiece you need very dark skies and dark adapted eyes very dark adapted eyes which is why we go to the lake taconic to do this kind of thing one of the advantages of using a camera is that you don't have to have dark adapted eyes I, there's no eyes at all and in fact, you can have terrible skies like I have here, and yet you can still see things. Okay, this is, uh, what did I send it for? M94? Uh, Let me try different exposure, or different, it, yeah. see which one turns out the best. I guess the medium is best here. And just barely in this region here, there are a lot of uh, outstretched arms, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and you can just barely see them here. And that is a spiral galaxy, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is. Let's see. Did we do M106? Not yet. Okay, let's do it. Jack, while we're waiting, we have a question from the chat. Someone says they're new to astronomy and are telescopes expensive to buy and maintain? Cool. Um, <laughs> that depends. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for those of you who may listen to uh, Northeast Public Radio, WAMC, Bob Berman, a uh, rather well-known uh, astronomy writer uh, was on, I believe, a um, day or so ago. And he got that question as well. And he didn't like the uh, answer given by the woman who was at Dudley, uh, the observatory in Albany, um, who was saying, you know, oh, you can get a nice Newtonian for a couple of hundred dollars. And Bob didn't like that at all. But Bob has a very, very big telescope and is very proud of it. So um, realistically, uh, being new to astronomy, one of the things that we generally whoo, uh, generally like to say is uh, first thing that you should get is a really good pair of binoculars. Exactly. I was waiting for you to say that. Yes. There you go. Yes. Uh, you really want to go out with something that's easy to carry around, will give you a reasonably good view of things. Um, you are probably not going to start doing the kind of things that we're seeing here. So you want to kind of get familiar with the sky and you can get a nice pair of good portable binoculars for anywhere from 75 at the very low end to uh, a couple of hundred dollars for a very reasonable nice end. If you want to be really silly, you can get the Canon and your image stabilizer uh, binoculars for uh, well over a thousand. And they are fabulous. They are fabulous, but boy, are they expensive. Um, one of the things that we like to say is that the best telescope in the world is absolutely no good to you if it's too heavy to carry out and set down someplace and use. Um, you might get a good clue from the uh, image in Greg's little animation at the lower right corner that he has a very big telescope and it's mounted on a pier. That thing doesn't move. Um, so that's great. I'm not going to bother to ask him how much money he spent on all of that stuff, but I will bet you it was more than I want to spend on a telescope. <laughs> um, that pier is probably down in the ground eight to 10 feet uh, to be nice and stable. And uh, the computerized guidance mount and all the equipment on there is probably, you know, up in the several thousands uh, for everything involved there. So you got a happy medium. Um, there are some very nice, smallish, 
what we call Newtonian telescopes, which are ref re, uh, reflectors. They have mirrors in them. They tend to be very light. They tend to be relatively small for the amount of optics that you get. Um, there is a group called Astronomers Without Borders, similar to Doctors Without Borders. Uh, they have uh, contracted with a group that's producing a nice portable five inch diameter, which means that the big mirror down in the bottom is five inches in diameter, uh, rather respectable scope uh, for $200. Um, there are a number of styles of telescopes that you can get. Um, I have a, uh, several of us have a couple of talks on how to pick a telescope. It's much more than we go into here. But uh, the essential thing is that the thing that you think of when you think of a telescope is usually what we call a refractor, which is uh, light comes in one end, bends down through uh, lenses and exits the back into your eye using only glass, hopefully glass, um, and reflectors, which use mirrors to accomplish the same thing. Uh, for a given um, dollar amount, the reflectors are usually a larger diameter, means a little bit better light gathering power. Um, and the refractors are usually for a given uh, dollar amount, fairly small in diameter, but relatively portable and have some other advantages as well. So this is the kind of thing that you want to do something like get involved with a club such as the Mid-Hudson Astronomical Association. Uh, we actually have telescopes we will lend you uh, for members. And you can try things out, see what you like. You can come to our in-person star parties and try out different scopes, see different uh, ways they're configured. It is a really big subject. There have been many, many books written on it. Once again, the best first telescope is a nice pair of binoculars and just hanging out with folks uh, who stare at the sky at, the sky at night and uh, kind of get the lay of the land and figure out which way you want to go from there. I know it's a pretty lousy answer. Everybody wants to say, you know, oh, go out and buy this telescope. Uh, that doesn't really work. I would, you know, obviously we can't go to a real sky party at this time of the year, but when we open up again, I strongly recommend anybody who's considering buying a telescope, go to one of these parties There'll be a lot of scopes out there, a lot of different kinds, and you'll get a good idea of what you can really see. And I'll, I'll mention that our star parties at Lake Taconic are open to the public. You don't have to be a member. Um, we also have uh, public lectures once a month at SUNY New Paltz once we are back able to, to get together face to face. And again, those are free too. You don't have to be a member for these public events. If you want to join um, and help us with our, our group costs, it's $25 for a year. And you can then borrow a telescope from uh, the, the few that we have. And we've got some pretty good ones too. It's not junk. Here we've got a little satellite, well, satellites, I don't know if it's a satellite, but a small galaxy right here. I don't know if it shows up in your picture or not. Oh yeah, quite nice. Right here. Now, which one is this again? This is. Um, I think this is one oh. I can look and see M one oh six. One oh six. Okay, that's when I started talking, and I didn't get to write that one down. Yeah. Um, if there's anything specific that you'd like to know about a particular telescope or a particular idea or something like that, we can chat about it perhaps after uh, we do the imaging. I'm willing to stick around forever, and I do love to talk about telescopes. One very nice thing about using a camera with a telescope, I know we were just talking about entry to astronomy and this is not an entry, um, but one of the nice things about having a nice camera is if you get lost in the sky, you don't know where you are, you know, you can tell a computer, I want you to take a photograph, compare it against the sky and you tell me where I am so you can never get lost. Okay. I'm going to throw one other story in there occasionally. I haven't seen him for a little while, but occasionally we have a gentleman who comes up to uh, Lake Taconic and um, 
he was telling me that, uh, you know, he was uh, just talking to somebody about astronomy and said, yeah, well, I'm getting to look into the stars, bought a telescope. He's looking at the scars and he's seeing gray stuff. And he's like, well, this is dumb. So he, somebody said, well, you need a bigger telescope. So he bought a bigger telescope. And he says, oh, I don't know, I want to see all the colors. He says, well, you can't do that. You have to use astrophotography to do that. And he's like, well, what's that? And so he learned about astrophotography, bought himself a scope. And he was like, hmm, I don't like what this is doing. So he bought himself another scope. And this kept going. So he comes up to the Taconic right now, uh, to the state park, and essentially pulls up in his, um, I believe he has a F-350, Ford F-350 and begins to unload approximately a quarter of a million dollars worth of telescopic equipment. And he takes some of the most amazing pictures I have ever seen in my life, but it's a quarter of a million dollars worth of telescopic equipment. So do be careful. <laughs> People think yeah, flying is bad. Warn you that if, if it's really easy to take a uh, camera, say your phone, and uh, take a picture of the moon through a telescope um, but I warn you, it's very dangerous. If you've got any geekness inside you, it could start you onto the world of imaging. And you can start with cheap hardware and free software, but you're going to want better stuff all the time. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> yeah. uh, Greg, we got a question in the chat. Uh, wanting to know if there's any planetary nebula visible tonight. Uh, I believe probably. that we were seeing one the other night, weren't we? I can't remember Are what. Did we see one? Is uh, the Hearts not planetary nebula, is it? No, the Hearts a an uh, emission nebulae. Okay, right. Uh, we're probably not able to see any planetary nebulae tonight because we're pointed away from the Milky Way. Um, if you wait three months or so, we'll be back pointed in the evening into the Milky Way, and that's where all the planetary nebulae are, or the ones that we can see. Um, at least I can't think of any that are visible right now. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember because I've been watching so many um, star programs lately and they were, somebody had one on. I thought it was us, but I guess it wasn't. A, no uh, just a, a question uh, on the uh, M106 M image. The, uh, around seven o'clock on the image, the lower left-hand corner, there's a streak that looked like it could be some sort of a... Uh, oh, yeah. This right here? Yeah. yeah, I suspect that's uh, Starlink. I'm sure if I take another photo, that will disappear. I'm gonna see. So it's yeah. not a plane. It's a 30 second you know, image. A plane. I thought it looked like it might have been blinking a little brighter in the one spot. Well, I can uh, disappear. Yeah, maybe. I, I, yeah, I can't tell whether it's a. It could be a plane. It could be a meteor. It could be. Mm. What else could it be? A satellite. There was a Starlink pass. I can't tell if it was really recent. Let's see. And if you were pointed maybe uh, sort of southwest off of Zenith, that might be Star a Starlink. We have so many darn satellites up there nowadays. It, uh, yeah. Astrophotographers are going nuts. Disappeared now. Yep. We've got a question from Facebook. What uh, what object are we imaging now? And I think I've lost lost cat track. What M106, is it? isn't it? Yeah. M106. Yeah, I don't know if it has a name associated with it. Most of them I, do have names, but I will I look it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, now it's interesting to note that when you have oh, let's say that was a satellite uh, image. When you're normally taking photos, I, I take, you know, let's say 20 photos in a night and the computer can check all 20 photos and recognize that that line appears only in one of them and therefore can't be real. And it right. will actually eliminate uh, that line in your photos. So it's fairly smart. No other name really, but uh, I'll just say that it's uh, 22 to 25 million light years from Earth. Okay, let's move on to something else. M63, Whoa. how about that one? Sunflower Nebulae? Uh, I mean, Galaxy? I don't know whether that's an interesting one or not. I can't remember. The problem is I always take these 10 or 20 hour exposures. I normally don't do this. 
this way, so I'm not used to what you can see. Well, that's part of the adventure of seeing what's there. Yeah, that's true. I'm enjoying this myself um, because I don't look at things this way. Uh, I, hit, I think I hit go to. Uh, this is another 30 second exposure. I know I said I wasn't going to take 30 second exposures because it's kind of long, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, it works. This one might need it. Let's get the data on this. Daydreaming here, I guess. You can see a little bit of action around here. Not a lot. Let's try another globular cluster, M92. Cool. Moving at all? Either, either it's very close or I didn't hit the button properly. <laughs> Let me try a 10 second exposure on this. Globular clusters are quite bright, so you don't really need a lot of exposure with them. <clears throat> if you want a planetary, 97 is a planetary. Okay, we'll take a look and see. Just gotta remember it. No, I, don't, I don't think I hit the go to button. Oh, no, I, I did, but. I have it set on M63. All right, this time I will get M92. <laughs> and now I see it moving. Hey. Okay. And there we have another globular. Oh, yeah. What was that? Looks similar to our first one. Very globular. Carl, was that you that suggested? Carl suggested 97. 97? Correct. OK. M97. See where it is in the sky. You feel like a DJ taking requests? It's easy. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be bright enough to see. Ooh, it's up by the corner of the dipper. Oh, yeah. And let's try a 10 second to start with. M97 doesn't ring a bell with me at all. It's owl also nebula. known as the Owl Nebula. Ah, yeah, the Owl. That was a nice one. Of course, 10 seconds. Okay. Much. Let's try a 30 second with it. That's thanks to John from Facebook. Oh, okay. Yep. So we did get our planetary, yay. Yeah. Misnamed, right. but there you go. Next, maybe we should try our comet. See if we can see that. Yes, I was about to say, we got to get to our comet now. Mm -hmm. Let's don't forget that. It's broken into several pieces by now, so I wonder if we can see more than one. Well, all we can do is try. Okay, let me try uh, changing the contrast a little bit. How's that? Oh, looks like an owl. Let's 
Okay. All right. Let me see that. We also got another streaky in there too. Oh, do we? Yeah, but a bright uh, uh, oh, one o'clock off that bright star. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. I, I need to put in coordinates for the uh, comet. Are you saving any of these uh, as we no, go, I Greg? Wouldn't. I I guess maybe I should have, but I didn't. Save a couple. We can post them on our meetup page. Yeah, well, definitely yeah, save the owl one right now. We can go back and get a couple of those that I, I like sure. a lot. Um, okay, I'm not going to. While you do that, I am going to go put the address to your website up on the chat. Oh, yeah. If people like these short short time exposures they're going to love his long time exposures <laughs> not where i thought it was 25 s no nope, that's not the right thing Okay, let's hope I entered those coordinates correctly. Let's also hope that I got the right coordinates. See what we can see. I just put uh, your website address up in the group chat. It's uh, HTTP colon slant slant astro nut case dot net A S T R O N U T C A S E dot net. Just in case it uh, doesn't feed over to Facebook that way. So if we're doing requests, we have one for M one o eight eight, which is near M ninety seven, okay. and that comes from John on Facebook. All right. I don't see oh, is that oh, we got the comet in there? Mm -hmm. Cool. This is the comet? Yep, this is the comet. Let's save it. Definitely save that because that's going to change over time. Yep. I took this one uh, a few days ago too in our meeting. I'll have to compare the two, see how far it's moved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see a little bit of the breakup in there can't you, can you? maybe discern at least three i think there's like five or six different segments now isn't there um i don't know i don't know if i can see that in this yeah I, well, i'm seeing a, a a bright head and then just behind it maybe a little separation yeah. a gap and then another yeah right where his pointer is is another one Or it's in your imagination. Yeah, the color was. <laughs> <laughs> I have a vivid imagination. Well, we should get a long, uh, get a long exposure on that, maybe. Yes. Well, okay, I can do that. Um, well, it doesn't have to be right now, but uh, okay. while it's, well, it's not going to be there for next week. Oh yeah, no. that's the most fascinating thing right now. That's the one thing we're looking at tonight that ain't going to be there in a bit. So maybe we could spend a little. Yeah, extra maybe, energy uh, on that after uh after we get through with this the ones who are interested in can stick around and we'll do longer exposures what was the uh the uh 
object Re uh, request repetitive. was for M108. 108. 108. 108. Find it. Uh, really? Well, well, let's try it. Bart Spiral. Jack? Yes. It's astronutcase.net, did you say? That's correct. It's in the chat. You have to be a little crazy to be interested in this hobby. Quarter of a million dollars for crazy. <laughs> well, I don't have that kind of equipment. <laughs> I'm not quite that, that crazy. I'm pretty sure he counts the cost of the F-350 in there. <laughs> and the Catskills Astronomy Club has joined us on Facebook and there says that a wide shot would get M97 and M108 in the same frame. Don't think we can change the angle, right, Greg? Well, uh, all we can do is slew the scope one way or the other. If it fits within a 50 minute, 50 arc minute area, you can get them both. And I can find that out with the other program here, but I'm not sure. I'll go for one first and then maybe we can play with it. What do we got here? <clears throat> It almost looks like M82 again. This is 108? Uh, that's what I entered in, yeah. I, let's hesitant to do this because of the response time I'm seeing. But, what? Yeah. It's 108 for sure. Uh, that scope is doing something right now that there is no way in any possibility I'd be able to do <laughs> if I had my scope out there looking at that. Hey, look at that straight up. You have to turn on more labels to see it straight up. Boy, it is straight up. That is, it's zenith, man. Everything I've got absolutely hates being straight up. Now, this little box represents the visible area that that scope is seen right now. Um, but apparently the things are too dim. I don't have the, all the labels turned on. I'd have to turn on more labels. So I don't think I'm going to do that. Okay, what can we look at here? How about the dumbbell? Uh, sure, a dumbbell is what? Remember the number? Well, I can just look for dumbbell. I can get it too. I'm looking. M27. M27? Uh-huh. Yep. I don't. Oh no, it's it's uh, not visible right now. Looking over here, the altitude is a minus eleven degrees. Oops. Weren't we looking at it uh, Wednesday night? No, I don't think so. I, I showed some uh, long-term photographs that you may remember from that. Yep. That was it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember that one at all from actual visuals. I'm going to go back to M51. Well, um, okay. Because I was going to say, we've also got the heart and soul nebulas that are... Uh... Yeah, I don't... Uh, they're very large nebulae. I think I need a different scope for that. Okay. Which I do have, but it's not mounted.
fact, I, I just got a mirrorless camera with an 85 millimeter lens on it. And the uh, heart and soul are one of the targets that I plan to shoot with that. Nice. But if you did, if you did look at them, what would go, what would happen? You just fill the field of view with, you wouldn't see the edges. It would be so large. Um, yeah. In fact, you probably look like nothing. <laughs> uh, look like a cloud. Like, yeah. But as I recall, it's, this is the wrong season for that. I mean, I can look and see, but I don't think it's visible in the sky. You mean the the heart and soul? Yeah, they're uh, it's right next to the to the dipper. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, we can try it. That's an ideal candidate for a narrow band filter hydrogen. Yes. Output. That's true. The uh, double cluster in Perseus might be out there then if, if the heart is out. Huh. There we go. Oh, I, I didn't. Say oh, my. That's back to uh, 51. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, so you want to try the heart? Uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Sure. Okay. Why not? Where is What's it? the? Is, uh, is that a Messier? This one M fifty one. Oh, okay. No, no, no this, this is a Messier. The heart, yeah. no, the heart is not. Okay. Uh, I've forgotten the nomenclature for that one, but I think if I just type in heart, it'll. I yeah. I see eighteen oh five. Or sharpless or nebulously. It's just right off the handle, the big dipper. Like, where's yeah. the other thing, I believe? Unless I'm completely sideways, which I probably am. There, I don't see it. 20 degrees. It's got to be on the screen someplace. I don't see it. Let's see here. Ray's I don't know where it is. Let me. I don't see it. So it's not visible, but maybe it, it may be out there. Let's see if I can get you close here. Right off of up, I was, whoa, this isn't responding to me. Yeah, it's not, no, you won't see it. I'm um, sorry. Uh, it's not the one I was thinking of. What was no. I thinking of? I was playing around with Stellarium today, running into a bunch of nebulas, for, but now I don't know what I was doing now. Take one last look here. Um, I see these Sombrero galaxy here, M104. Uh -huh. so, That's a cool one. Yeah. One. Is the whale galaxy uh, visible? We had a request on Facebook from Gaskell's Astronomy for that. Uh, sure, we could take it. Oh, I th yeah, I thought we saw that the other night too, didn't we? No, uh, I don't think so. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, the whale? Is that W H A L E or no? Yeah, W H A W H U. Or NGC 4631. Correct. Okay. Uh, find. Yeah, oh, it's weighted. No, it can't be. It'd be just an accident. Oh, all right. Well, let's go, go to it. Yeah, whale and crowbar right next to it, too. Jack, we have a question from Facebook. What does M104 mean? Can you explain uh, the M? Uh, M, everything that we refer to when you say M5, M51, M64, the M stands for Messier, M-E-S-S-I-E-R. Uh, that is Charles Messier, I believe French astronomer, uh, the 1700s who was hunting comets. 
And I was explaining this earlier, what I really love about uh, the Messier objects is that Herr Messier, uh, Monsieur Messier, I guess I should say, um, wrote all of these down because he studied them and found that they were not comets, so therefore they were not to be bothered with. Just don't bother looking at these, they're not comets, you're going to think they are. Therefore, they were uninteresting. The uh, fascinating part about that, of course, is that they are some of the most fascinating, most interesting things that we can look at. And uh, it was just uh, an amusement at the time that uh, hunting comets was a bit more important than really finding out what this stuff was. So that's all that M means. Uh, there are some, I forget exactly, 119 or so. I believe that uh, Messier himself found somewhere around 97, I think. I don't remember exactly. And then some other folks followed after him. Uh, I guess they are ne necessarily in uh, primarily, predominantly Northern Hemisphere. But that's all it means. It's a catalog that Charles Messier put together of things not to look at anymore. So I, I don't remember whether the whale is uh, Messier or not, but here it is. Nope, doesn't appear to be. He didn't see that one. <laughs> so it's a galaxy edge, John? Yes. Hard nice. spiral. OK, I see one bar, I think, on the left. It does look that way, doesn't it? Looks like a little sal satellite galaxy up above, too. Yep. Yeah. This is wonderful. Really is. It's not just a canned picture. That's a real picture. <laughs> that is the that is current as you can get. <clears throat> um, well, it's ten o'clock. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other requests or not. But is there any other spiral nebula that you could see? Oh, probably. <laughs> In fact, I'm sure there are many. But I don't know what to be right now. Um, what we can do is, uh, if we want to give Greg a break, we'll shift over to Stellarium, and I will drive through that and show everybody where we've been looking. Um, I've written down all of the objects we've been able to observe, and we can just I, wander uh, through that. Jack, that, that sounds yeah. that that sounds like a great idea. Maybe Greg would like to dwell on the comet and get a long exposure while you're doing that. Yes. Uh, yep. And then we come back come back and see what we get from a longer exposure on the comet. Yep. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. We'll get Stellarium back up here. And one other reason for doing that is, if you'll notice on the screen right now, we've got the whale galaxy we were just looking at. It's high lit with the little cursor bouncing in and out, but it also has that little red circle around it. And here's the little crowbar galaxy down here with, with the red again. When we back out, that red tends to hang on. That is Stellarium's way. It's, um, come on, bring the thing up down here. Down here is a button that gives me deep sky objects. If I turn that off, you'll notice they disappear. So what we can do is we'll look for those red objects as we zoom out here. We can see more and more of them show up or disappear. Whoops, that's too far. Let me also get rid of the lines and the names. And um, we can uh, probably see another couple of uh, objects. Messier objects appear to be uh, maybe yellow or something like that. I don't know. We see M3, we were looking at M3 earlier, so we'll probably start there. But what I want to do is back out and get oriented. OK, let's go to the north. And on the north on, we can identify right up in here. We can see the Big Dipper. I think that Stellarium should have a thing that I can use like a laser pointer. I'd love to be able to do that. But for right now, what I'm just going to do is turn on the lines. 
So we can see the Big Dipper part of the of Ursa Major, the bear, right through here. In fact, we can even be sillier than that, and we can turn on the imagery and say, oh, look, there's a bear up there. Somebody think that looks like a bear. Uh, and we have, of course, the pointer stars in the bowl of the dipper or the plow. Five, that dimension right there between the two end stars in the bowl, take that five times, one, two, three, four, five, roughly, you, and you get to Polaris. Scale might be a little skewed here because things change. You can see it bending around as I may, as I move things, but in the real sky, that is um, uh, pretty obvious out there. And you see, that's not exactly in line, but there you go. So that's our orientation. We're looking north and the uh, Big Dipper is something that people can readily recognize in the sky. So let's see. The first thing we looked at was M3. So we're going to ask Stellarium to go find that. And again, here, keeping ourselves oriented, here's the Big Dipper. You can see M3 right near Arcturus, another very bright star. So let's see now. We went from M3, we went to M51. All right, so here we have M3. Now we come right over to the edge of the, of the Big Dipper handle for M51. And if we want, we can zoom in. That's our favorite little whirlpool galaxy here. And there's a embedded image. This is, of course, we have to distinguish this from what we're looking at. This is an extremely long-term photograph like you will find on Greg's uh, web page, but we won't see here tonight because this takes far too long to generate. But these colors are essentially real, unless they've been in any way false colored. Uh, if you allow enough light to accumulate over enough time, there is color information in there. And uh, if Greg were to take several exposures using his filters and a tremendous amount of time, we see something very close to this. But that is an embedded image that Stellarium has stored in here. It's not like we're actually looking at that with our own eyes right now. Quick point. Yes. I was at a, a symposium with James Michener once. And during the break, we were both looking at a picture of the whirlpool and he mentioned to me that is his favorite sky object. And there is there was a picture on his desk of that mm. very gallery. <laughs> I was outstanding. Like, I was floating on the, on air after that. <laughs> <laughs> we went from uh, the whirlpool to the black eye, which is M64. So we moved from there to here. Again, if we zoom in, there she is. Remember that central bar that was dark in the image. That's the central bar in the uh, galaxy there. So we went from basically right here, just straight across a little bit straight to the east to the black eye. Then from there, we went to M81, Bode's galaxy. almost across the sky, back across the Big Dipper. Everything's kind of hovering right here around the Big Dipper, isn't it? So there we have, that was Bodes and the Cigar and the Garland. So we've got quite a few hovering right around in through here. And you can see there's a few others up here if we Scan over here, we can see Coddington's Nebula. Oh, whoops, I think I lost it. Where'd he go? Looks like an emission nebula there. Just a little bit of gas being lit up by a star somewhere. Probably really hard to see. So let's see, we went from Bodes to the Cigar, M82. Is right next door. And 
Then we went to M94, the lovely spiral. <clears throat> that is, come on, back out. There we go. Uh, there is the Big Dipper. So it's just off the base, kind of in here. A couple of bright-ish stars make a nice locator for that. Why does that say Croc's eye instead of spiral? Nice. From M94, we went to the pinwheel 101. Whoops. Uh, too many characters. Now let's back off here first, see where we are. Oh, there we are at Big Dipper again. I actually found that once. Oh yeah, that would be an easy one because you've got the two end stars of the Big Dipper here. And by the way, another thing we like to point out at star parties is uh, Mizar, is the second star in the handle in on the Big Dipper is actually a double star. And um, some folks say that that used to be used as an eye test for sailors and other people long ago where uh, if you could tell, you can actually see that. I can't, my eyes are not that good, but um, young folks especially, and uh, quite a few people up uh, in the older area as well, not me, can actually discern naked eye without a telescope that there are two stars there. You get a telescope in there, you find that there's uh, a bit more than two, it's actually three. So that's just fascinating. Anyway, back to the galaxy. Well, we got a mess coming on down here. We got a lot of things happening there, apparently. Look at that. Apparently got a little something going on here. All of these NGCs are different catalog things. Some of them behind or in front of this galaxy, but uh, that's that the lovely pinwheel. appeared in uh, this month's either, I think it was Sky and Telescope, but it might've been Astronomy, where they went over all those little things and <laughs> nice so let's see we went from uh 101 i think we went to well let's see this is out of order but we did go to 106 in there i think the pinwheel was actually before 101 but that's okay let's get uh m106 up let's back out and see where we are here once again, off the back side of the Big Dipper. And I'm going to be waving my telescope right around the back end of the Big Dipper when I get back out with it, that's for sure. And then the Leo triplet, that beautiful set. Oops, just spell it right. Okay, let's see here. We moved a bit away from. Um, the dipper at that point we're off the bottom here and there's leo leo is uh, relatively easy to spot because of the sort of question mark shaped set of stars here so right yeah, but it's a lot back. harder without the lines well that's true but that's actually pretty obvious let me turn the lines off they're bright enough oh come on where get over there Doink. there we go they're bright enough, and I can't get rid of the names right now, that, that that actually is kind of obvious. That and the, I always see this arc right here. But this again is what is really helpful to get out with people who know what they're looking at. And um, we've got uh, nice green lasers that point at things and uh, we can point these things out for real that uh, make it pretty obvious, but there's the triplet. That's what they call the hamburger galaxy. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard it called that. I don't know, that's, that's what it says. Hamburger galaxy, Leo triplet. I also call it Hamlet's ghost and vanishing galaxy. That's kind of weird. Um, but there you go. Now let's see here. From the triplet, we did the sunflower M sixty three, and 
and we've got a whole bunch of them right into here. But the sunflower was that little guy there. And let's see, in that area, notice that we've also got a whirlpool. The whirlpool there, the crocs eye we looked at, I believe. So we're in the same, there's good old Big Dipper right there. They're all right in there. Uh, let's see, we went from M63 to M92. M92, let me get some lines on here so we've got something that can give us some guide. Um, Hercules. Hercules cluster. Uh, Hercules is pretty obvious because of this sort of rhombus, squarey looking arrangement here. It's pretty obvious when you're out really looking at it. And so in here we had our nice little globular cluster of stars. And then we went to M97, that lovely planetary nebula. The owl, and let's see here. Oh, look, it's the Big Dipper again. There's a neat full color picture of the owl. Okay. Now, didn't you say that was incorrectly called a planetary? Well, uh, they named them planetary nebulas before they knew that they really, they, they thought they were planet forming objects and they're not, okay. it's exploding stars. Okay. In this case, anyway. So, yeah, the name is misleading. Okay, any you. of them. Any of them that are planned here. Okay, now uh, I'm going to, we can look at where uh, Atlas, Comet Atlas was, is rather, but for some reason, uh, not that way we won't. Slash, there we go. But for whatever reason, I don't have an image. Um, I know that Eric does have an image on his, but I don't. So the best that I can do right here is say that um, if we keep those little markers in place, what we can do is if you wanted to go out on the next clear night, you won't see it there because the next clear night's not gonna be for another week and a half. But uh, you can use something like this to locate where it should be. Right now, it happens to be nice and convenient because you've got Venus, which is incredibly obvious, brightest thing in the sky other than the moon, and the moon's not very bright right now. Very bright star Capella, and that distance again and slightly down gives you location for a comet that you can't see naked eye. You might be able to see with a good pair of binoculars. You get a telescope up in there, look around, you'll probably see it. By the way, I should notice that we were lucky when we looked at it because there are clouds there now. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> nice. So you can image it now? I imaged it and you oh. can kind of tell what it is. Okay. Uh, if you send, if you go back to me. Give I'll me, well, this is the last one. Exposure. Yeah, here's M108, which is the last one. As our uh, sunflower, I think, is that say what they say? Surfboard. Do, uh, the whale? Uh, uh, didn't write down the whale. What? What's? Uh, let's go do that. Sorry about that. I must have been doing something. Okay. There's the whale and the crowbar. I believe that's what you shifted to see, right? Yeah, we didn't do that. Whale and crowbar, let's find out where we are. Not too far away from the Big Dipper here. Down towards Arcturus. So we have the whale and the crowbar right there. And I need to write those down. Okay. And with that, does anybody have any particular questions? Um, yes. I want to know how you got through all those so fast. And, and the, that search window that I saw popped up there, is that from you? F3. 
Yep. And where's is that a part of solarium or is that yes, a... it is? Oh yeah, I couldn't do it without that. And where would I find that? Um, number of places, as I said, F3, or if you pull up your help thingy, uh, come on, get off my second screen, come back here, right there, that magnifying glass right there. We'll move you the your mouse. Thing. Yeah, move your mouse to the left side of the screen and the menu bar there pops out. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to the, the uh, magnifying glass to search window. Okay, thanks. And then I think there's also one down here. I see. Uh, there it is, show search dialog right there. But it looks like it searches for other, oh, that's meteor shower search. Didn't actually know that. This thing does do meteor showers as well. This is a lovely piece of software, um, free for computers. If you put it onto a tablet or a phone, it might cost a few dollars. I have spent that because this is incredibly useful. Four bucks. But four bucks on the piece. Yeah, I, I've seen it everywhere. I think I paid maybe five. I've seen it as much as twenty-five. It's like it's like how desperate are the guys this week? You know, I don't know. Uh, mobile devices. I, I think it's it's free on the laptop. Free on the right? PC. Yeah, any PC is free. Um, it gives you indication of the. We just went through the Lyrids, uh Meteor Shower. Early, was it early this week? I think yes, it was early yeah. this week. It was the night, uh, the night of our meeting. It was uh, Wednesday morning. Um, Anybody and see it? I know I didn't, and I think that I looked at some of the NASA pictures, and and it was like, oh, massive fireballs, and the thing goes, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's like a little. Deep. This is not a big, strong meteor shower. Um, but uh, it does give you clues as to uh, generally the uh, what they call the radiant, uh, where the meteors might appear to come from. They can appear anywhere in the sky. You can see them anywhere at all. But if you if you saw one over here, if you trace the line back, it would appear as though it came from this area here. And um, those will appear all over the place at various times. Um, another interesting thing, which uh, I'm going to turn off my lines here that we can do with Stellarium is we can speed up time and slow down time. So I'm just going to kind of shotgun this a little bit, just speed it up a little bit. We'll start to see things move. They were actually moving before, just quite slow. And we didn't really see it happening. If you look at the clock right down here at the bottom, you can see it counting off pretty quick. We're gonna speed it up some more every time we click it. And I'm looking for something specific. I'll hopefully stop things if I do see it. There we go. Let's give it a real kick here. I think I just saw. I'm not catching any good satellites yet. Um, this thing does. Oh, wait a minute. Do I have my satellite? Yeah, I've got my satellite hints on. Okay. Um, this thing does keep track of uh, a lot of satellites. Oop, there went one. And let's see if I can catch it on the way back here. I'm backing up time now. Well, this is going to get boring. In any case, what you do when you see one of these is you'll see something that looks like a star suddenly go shooting across the field. And you can stop it and see things. You could track ISS this way. You can track various other satellites. If you look up some night and you say, hey, I see something moving up there. I wonder if that's a satellite. You can come in here, look at the um, area of the sky and uh, run time forward and backward and check it out. Um, and then the only other thing that I've really got is that uh, some of us um, have heard that I'm going to move time forward here. Now let's move it backwards. So I want to see the moon for a second. We have heard uh, that there's going to be a smiley face moon showing up. Well, I was kind of curious about that because the orientation of things didn't look quite right to me. And um, so I used Stellarium and I ran time forward to uh, when they said things were going to happen. When the sun gets close to the moon here, I'm sorry, when the, when the moon gets close to the sun, 
the sun illuminates just a tiny little sliver here. So that might create a smiley face. Um, Venus is the only thing in the area here right now. But if we turn off our horizon, hello, and we move to the other side, we can see that down here we've got Jupiter and Saturn. They're leading the sun, which means that uh, uh, the sun has, uh, is going to be up when Jupiter and Saturn are up, most likely. They'll set first and the sun will set later. But eventually the moon does come into right into this area in about a month or two, month, a month and a half. Problem is it's not a happy face. It's a very nice half moon, uh, which we call last quarter facing that way. So it doesn't look at all like a smiley face. I don't know where these people come up with that stuff. Is that but a morning, morning what's thing? What's that? Is that a morning? Uh, but it's about noon, I think, about two or two or three in the afternoon. Um, oh. I uh, I did track it through the day, and you know if you see that thing, I you know I don't know. I haven't seen anybody actually debunk it yet, but it's not going to happen. Don't waste your time with that. But the fun part is you can use Stellarium to uh, examine something like that, and uh, we have had uh, historical items. We do have a one of our members on here tonight has used uh, Stellarium to go back in time and uh, discover things about uh, a painting made by a rather famous local artist. So it can be done. Anything else that anybody would like to? Yeah, I want to, I'm wondering if what Greg got from the comet, even if there's some clouds. Oh yeah, well here, let me stop my share so that Greg can share again. Okay. Up to you, Greg. Yeah, let me see if I can share get to it okay come on oh yeah hey, notice all yeah, this yeah. junk in here see what you mean by those clouds two minute exposure which is quite a bit longer than before i don't remember what we before but i know it's a lot longer and notice all this stuff here and the comet itself is quite a bit dimmer yeah wow well, we got lucky to see it at all, believe me. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess last call for questions. So we'll wrap this up. How long is this exposure? This is a two minute exposure. Okay. Thank you. Let me. Uh... Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a great night. All thank right. you. Mm -hmm. I thank everyone for attending. Uh, we got really lucky. As I mentioned earlier, if, uh, if it wasn't for Greg and this kind of operation here, uh, we wouldn't have had a star party this month. It's uh, going to be miserable the next couple of days. And we got a very lucky window here in the sky. And it's marvelous that, um, that Greg has offered his time and equipment so that we could do this. I definitely uh, suggest you go take a look at his web page. Uh, link is in the chat and um, have a look at some of the really marvelous work that he's done over hours and hours and hours of this stuff. And I might add his pictures that the Poughkeepsie Journal published in their article really popularized what we're doing here tonight. Thanks, Greg. Marvelous, indeed. Well, hope you enjoyed it. Definitely. Virtual Thank applause. you, Greg. <laughs> And with that, we'll uh, we'll close the uh, the first actual star party, not pop up, uh, first planned. And thank everybody for coming. Take care. Okay. Okay. Good night. Have a good one. See you later. Anybody want to stick around for an after, or uh, we all too tired? Why don't we go to the diner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be nice. <laughs> Have a virtual diner. <laughs> All righty. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Marvelous work. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Thank you so much. Sure. And tonight, I to remember to, turn, to cover up the telescope, which I forgot to do the other night. Oh, gosh. Yes, please do. Yeah, uh, this, please. <laughs> it's not going to stay dry forever. Okay. See you later. Good night. Thanks again.